On tonight's program, we will conclude our discussion about how the founders of the United States identified with the historical traditions and customs of the Hebrews, the ancient Hebrews in the Old Testament, and how the Hebrew Bible played a significant role in our nation's founding. So gather your children and your grandchildren as we take a journey back in U.S. history. Good evening. I'm your host, Laurie Cardoza-Moore, and this is PJTN Online. Tonight, we're going to talk about um, our organization, our mission, how you can get involved, and we're going to continue our discussion about the history of this country that is not being taught in our U.S. schools. So this is our opportunity once a week to, to talk about related topics and to hear from you, to hear your comments and um, answer your questions. So I'm glad you're tuning in tonight. We've got an incredible show, lots of interesting things to share with you. So I hope you have a notepad and a pen. You're taking notes so you can share this information with your family and friends. The mission of proclaiming justice to the nations is to educate Christians about our biblical responsibility to stand with our Jewish brethren and defend the state of Israel against the rise of anti-Semitism. And of course, we all know that anti-Semitism is on the rise globally, not just in Europe as we've seen in the past, but even here, right here in the United States of America, which is shameful because the United States of America is a Judeo-Christian nation. But that's why we have our show. That's why we produce our programs, so we can educate Christians to stand against this, this age-old ancient hatred. We produce award-winning programs and documentary films to share with our viewers, our audience, all over the world. So I hope you'll go to our website and you'll order some of our programs to share with your family and friends. We also distribute those programs to 21 global media partners in 200 nations, ultimately reaching 2.6 billion viewers. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that's right. No other organization is reaching 2.6 billion viewers every week, every week with our award-winning programs. I also want to invite you to become a PJTN Watchman tonight. We can't do the incredible work we do without the partnership of so many friends like you. And I want to thank all of those of you who have joined PJTN, who've signed up to become a watch watchman, who are contributing $20 a month to help us keep programs like this on the air and to reach more Christians around the globe. And also to encourage our Jewish brethren so that they know they don't stand alone. What is the role of the Watchman? You may be new to the program and new to PJTN. The mission of the, of the Watchman is to educate the inhabitants, just like it says in Ezekiel chapter 33. God warned the prophet that if the, if the prophet saw or the Watchman saw the enemy advancing upon a city, that it was the role of the Watchman to warn the inhabitants of the city so that they would be able to shield themselves. However, if the Watchman fails to warn the people and any innocent blood is spilled, it will be required of that watchman. However, if the watchman does inform the inhabitants and the inhabitants refuse to heed the warning of the watchman, then if any innocent blood is spilled, it will be required of them. And that's what our role at PJTN is. Whether you're a watchman here in the United States in one of our communities or around the world, you have a biblical responsibility to stand with our Jewish brethren against this hatred. As a watchman, you also commit to not only financially supporting PJTN, but prayerfully. We rely on the prayers of Christians and Jews all over the world who pray for us, who pray for the work that we do and pray for our message. So I want to just encourage you to consider becoming a PJTN Watchman tonight. All it takes is a monthly contribution of just $20 a month to support these efforts. And our goal this year um, is to sign up 7,000 new PJTN Watchmen. Your monthly donation will help ensure that PJTN remains on the front lines and in the headlines of this all-encompassing war. In 1 Kings chapter 19, we're reminded that God said to Elijah that he had preserved 7,000 who had not bowed their knee to Baal, to a false god. And the same is true um, about with regards to anti-Semitism. One of the issues that we deal with within Christianity is replacement theology. And replacement theology, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, it basically um, is teaching by Christian leaders throughout history since the time of Christ that since the Jews rejected Jesus the Messiah, 
God's blessing and promises now go to the, they're transferred to the church, which is a lie. God's covenant with Israel is eternal. He promised Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants for eternity that he would remain in covenant with them. And, oh, by the way, the land is part of that covenant. Our goal, again, is 7,000 new watchmen, so I hope that you will prayerfully consider becoming a watchman tonight. We believe there are watchmen around the world who haven't bowed their knee, and we know um, this past week I had a conference call um, with, from South Africa. I spoke with a woman who is starting a PJTN chapter in Johannesburg, as well as the head of South Africa Friends of Israel, and we are going to be collaborating together, the new chapter and um, South Africa Friends of Israel. We've been working with South Africa Friends of Israel. We've been sending them our media. They use our filming and our, pro our films and our programs to help reach out for, as an outreach to the Christian community. And it, it enables them to have dialogue about these biblical issues from both of their perspectives. And so now, because anti-Semitism is on the rise, and of course, out of South Africa comes the false um, boycott, divestment, and sanctions uh, movement who um, accuses Israel of being an apartheid state that is persecuting the Palestinian people like what happened in apartheid South Africa, which is another complete lie. And of course, we have programming. We produce documentary films, one specifically called Boycott This, that we actually produced for the millennial audience to show the millennials that the, the false claims about Israel being an apartheid state isn't true. In fact, we interviewed Palestinians, Arabs, both Muslim and Christian, to get their perspective. And we also have a great interview with UNRWA, who wasn't really pleased with us at the end of the interview because had he, as you'll see in the film, and this is his words, not mine, but had he known that that was what the, the interview was going to be about, he never would have accepted it. Why? Because the truth is going to go out? So you be the judge. But you can go to the website, to our store page, and you can order Boycott This also. So I want to encourage you to do that. Um, we know that anti-Semitism, even within Christianity, is born out of ignorance. The purpose of our award-winning films is to, is to confront that ignorance with biblical truth and the facts, historical, archaeological, and legal. With a minimum donation, just $20 a month, folks, you can help. You can become a PJTN Watchman, and we'll send you a gift, a PJTN Watchman gift, for your contribution and your commitment to stand with us on a monthly basis. So please go to pjtn.org forward slash donate. Now in the headlines for this week, so for those of you who have been paying attention to what's going on, all things Israel, there's a great article that came out in the Daily Wire um, published by Emily Zanotti. And it's, with re it's in regards to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And if you were watching last week, you know that we talked about her because she was um, condemning Israel and accusing them of being occupiers. But then when the interviewer asked her, well, what does that mean? Oh, I don't know. I'm not an expert on the topic. But then a couple days later, she came out calling to occupy for Americans, to occupy our communities and police officers and, and police stations and, and um, government buildings to occupy because, of, because she disagreed with Trump's immigration policy. So one week, she doesn't know what occupy means. The next week, now she does. Well, so now we're going to occupy the United, we're going to occupy the United States. But she came out, there's an article this week about Cortez and how she is aligning herself with an avowed anti-Semite. And her name is Linda Sarsour. So for those of you who've been following her, Linda was one of the leaders of the Women's March earlier this year. And of course, Linda is an anti-Semite. She lies um, constantly about Israel and the false accusations that Israel is an apartheid state and they're abusing the Palestinians. But I thought that it was interesting because um, both Ocasio-Cortez and Sarsour headlined the 16th Annual Universal Muslim Association of America held over the weekend in Dearborn, Michigan. But she didn't take the stage by herself. She, um, alongside her vouching for her dedication to women's rights, 
and her progressive values was Women's March leader and noted anti-Semite Linda Sarsour. According to legal insurrection, Sarsour repeatedly did little to hide her girl crush on the newest member of the progressive elite, gushing over Cortez in a panel discussion on political activism. Sarsour also mentioned that same interview was Cortez's um, the interview that Cortez is pro-Palestine, even though Cortez had trouble articulating a position on the Israeli-Palestinian divide in an interview with PBS's Firing Line, even admitting quite publicly that she wasn't well-versed on the issue. So Cortez promised to seek out information on her own proposed two-state solution. Can't wait to see what that is. And it appears she might be seeking it out from noted expert on foreign policy, Sarsour. Mm. We can only imagine what they'll come up with together. Legal insurrection noted possible, possible issues for Cortez stemming from her joint weekend appearance. Although Cortez is pro-women's rights, the event was segregated and all females attended, including young girls, wore the hijab. And um, I find that interesting because she's so pro-women's rights, but unfortunately women in Islamic countries have no rights. And we know this because there's forced female genital mutilation on women. They are forced in some countries, Saudi Arabia has recently changed this, but in some countries women aren't allowed to drive. Women have to walk a few steps behind their husband. Um, it, the, the list goes on and on and on. But what I found interesting also um, um, about Sarsour being um, being at this, speaking at this event, Sarsour is also, for those of you who are not familiar with who she is, she is also a self-proclaimed civil rights activist. Um, she said supporters of Israel cannot be feminists. Well, I am, and I happen to be a feminist as well. So I'm not sure what her definition of feminism is or feminist is, but obviously she and I disagree on the term or who makes up part of that camp. Um, she also proudly backs the anti-Semitic BDS movement, which we all know is to falsely accuse Israel of being an apartheid state, treating Palestinians horribly when, of course, again, we have Christ, uh, Christian and Arab Muslims on camera who live in Israel who actually don't know what the issue is because they live freely and they're able to worship and practice their faith without any persecution of the Israeli government. In fact, their rights are protected by the Israeli government. Um, also, the next article I want to talk about, the role of the modern state of Israel in the fulfillment of biblical history. This was a great article that came out um, from a, a Bible prophecy, ChristianPost.com reported that um, when Donald Trump moved the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, many people of faith quickly recognized the biblical significance of such a move. And if you've been following me, you know we put out a press release and we talked about this. This was historical. Um, Trump, like King Cyrus before him, fulfilled biblical prophecy by recognizing that Jerusalem is the eternal capital of the Jewish state and that the Jewish people observe a righteous free and sovereign Israel. However, this was not the first time in the modern state of Israel's short 70 years that it has played a role in the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Many of the miracles, miracles we are witnessing in Israel today were promised in the Bible long ago. For example, in Ezekiel chapter 34, 13, the verse says, and I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them. The ingathering of the Jewish people, all the exiles, and all 12 tribes of Israel from the four corners of the world would begin. And we know that that's happening. Yes, the Jews are coming from Europe. They're coming from the United States. They're coming from all over the world. But there's also members of the tribes, like the tribe of Manasseh that's coming out of, um, out of India. And there are other tribes as well. Um, also, another uh, uh, biblically prophetic significant event is the spiritual partnership between Jews and Christians. And if you have been tuning in to PJTN online or you've watched any of our documentary films, you will know that we talk about Ephraim and Judah, that we will unite together, that there will come a time in the last days when the Jews will stop vexing 
um, Ephraim, and Ephraim will stop being jealous of Judah. But unfortunately, many Christians have, do not know who Ephraim is. They've never associated themselves with the blessing that Jacob, remember Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, gave to his grandson Ephraim, that he would grow into a multitude of fish in the midst of the sea. And one of the symbols that Christians, um, that you'll always find on Christian vehicles, jewelry, um, even pictures on walls, are the fish. Well, there's a reason, ladies and gentlemen. It's because that was the blessing that Jacob gave to his grandson Ephraim. Ephraim, if you re will recall from your Bible study, was Joseph's, one of Joseph's sons, and he was half Hebrew, half Egyptian. He was not fully Hebrew. Um, Joseph married a, um, a, a high priest of Egypt's daughter, so that made his children um, half Hebrew, half Egyptian. And we do recall that Jacob told Joseph when he was giving that blessing that, um, this, that these two boys would be his from here on out. Any children that Joseph had after those two boys would be Joseph's. But Ephraim and Manasseh belonged to Jacob. And Jacob said, I'm going to put my name on them, Israel. So there you go. So that's a quick lesson. But also um, the other prophetic event is the revitalization of the Hebrew language. The prophet Zephaniah describes how in the end of days, all the nations of the world will have purity of speech. For then I will make the, the peoples pure of speech so that they will invoke Hashem by name and serve him with one accord. That's in Zephaniah 3, 9. We understand that Zephaniah, or from Zephaniah, that all the nations of the world will study Hebrew to call out the name of God together in his holy language. And that's, in, that's um, incredible. And um, I share this article with you tonight because part of what we're going to discuss tonight is the issue of the Hebrew language and our founding fathers. So it's fascinating to see um, how even the United States of America, our early founders, wanted to make Hebrew the official language of the United States. Um, another topic I want to talk about tonight is the um, incident at the synagogue in Carmel, Indiana this past weekend, um, Saturday where, or Friday night, where a synagogue was defaced with um, swastikas and anti-Semitic um, graffiti. And I have not heard anything about the Christian community there in the local um, uh, Carmel community. I'm still waiting to hear what the outcome was, if there's been any Christian leadership who have reached out to the synagogue and made a public statement condemning this outrageous attack. But again, ladies and gentlemen, this is happening all the time in the United States. In fact, in 2017, the Anti-Defamation League, or ADL, came out with a report that showed a almost 70% increase in anti-Semitic incidents in the United States of America. It's pathetic. And we need to call these people out, and they need to be held accountable. And once they're, um, they also need to be brought to justice. Once they're caught, they need to be tried for defacing private property. Um, and then the final, again, here we are, Christian anti-Semitism, replacement theology running rampant, um, the last article I just want to mention is the Simon Wiesenthal Center um, protests Episcopal Church bishops' anti-Israel stance. Bishop Gail Harris of Massachusetts calls for punitive measures against Israel, is condemned for sp spreading fabrications bordering on blood libel. And we all know um, that there are many Christian um, denominations, the Presbyterians, the Mennonites, um, Church of Christ, and of course the Epi Episcopalians who are, have taken the side of the Palestinians. Doesn't matter that the Palestinians are butchering Jews in the streets of Jerusalem. It's okay because those church leaders think, well, the Jews are getting what they deserve. They rejected the Messiah, number one, and number two, they're occupying Arab land. So because they don't read their Bible. They read their doctrine and their tradition in their seminaries. That's the problem. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are in churches um, of these denominations and you've gone to your pastor, and maybe you haven't, maybe you need to, and ask your pastor where he stands on these issues. If he agrees, you should leave because I wouldn't want to remain. In fact, the numbers are proving here in the United States and in Europe 
that many Christians, real people of faith, are leaving these institutional churches because of the false prophets who stand in the pulpits every Sunday and sometimes Saturday to give the word to their congregants. So I hope that you will, um, again, um, seek out your pastor and find out where your pastor stands on these issues. Um, I want to just uh, um, also finish up by saying last week we talked about Facebook. That Facebook was targeting PJTN again. We were trying to launch some ads to try to find more like-minded Christians, Jews, and people of conscience on Facebook, and they blocked us. Well, we put a call into our Congresswoman, Marsha Blackburn's office, and we immediately, within two days, received a response back from Facebook letting us know our ads can continue. We were accused of putting out political ads, which, of course, we are a nonprofit organization. We are far from, from political. We are biblical. So that has been reconciled. So anyhow, I just wanted you to know that Facebook is paying attention. Um, I also want to just continue our discussion tonight on the role the Bible played in the creation of the United States and its constitutional republic. At a time when revisionist history orders the content in our children's textbooks and classrooms throughout America, we are slowly losing our historic connection to the role the Hebrew Bible played in the early foundations of this United States. In fact, under the new Common Core State Standards, we are no longer teaching our children about our founding. Edmund Burke stated, people will not look forward to posterity who never look backward to their ancestors. That is so true, ladies and gentlemen. We cannot know where we are going or what our destiny is unless we understand our past. And that is critically important. Today, because of the Common Core Standards in our state schools, we're starting at the Reconstruction period or following the Civil War. So we never get to learn about the persecution of the Puritans, why they fled Europe. We never get to learn about George Washington and the American Revolution and why they fought. No, we're starting at the Civil War, a time when our country was divided. And unfortunately, um, that is always referenced back to and blame, we're blamed and shamed because of that part of our history. There are things in the United States that we've done that we should not be proud of, but to continue to harbor and hype on that truth and not show how we've made tremendous progress, how we were a God-fearing Judeo-Christian nation at our founding. To leave all of this part of history out does a huge disservice to our children and the future of this constitutional rap, um, republic. In Rabbi Ken Spiro's book, World Perfect, The Jewish Impact on Civilization, he writes, quote, in England, the Puritan identification with the Bible was so strong that some Puritan extremists sought to replace English common law with biblical laws of the Old Testament, but were prevented from doing so. In America, however, there was far more freedom to experiment with the use of biblical law in the legal codes of the colonies. And this was exactly what these early colonists set out to do. Norman Brebejewski wrote, quote, the, pur the Puritan respect for Hebrew extended to it being a required subject on a par with Latin and Greek. And it was part of the curriculum in Harvard, Brown, Princeton, John Hopkins, Yale, Columbia, and Dartmouth, the last three of which universities preserve Hebrew inscriptions in their official seals. My, have, how those universities have changed. They've forgotten. They haven't studied their history to understand their destiny. And now look at what's happened to those universities. Um, the a Hebrew oration was given annually at Harvard graduation ceremonies until 1817. An intimate knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures in English translation was part of the formative home education of many New Englanders and early settlers in other regions. Right now, I want to show you a great video that I just found by Rabbi Mir Soloveitchik about the history of our nation's founding. 
Watch this. The Hebrew Bible lies at the center of the American imagination, and it is one of the central inspirations for the founders. Rabbi Meir Soloveitchik leads the oldest Jewish congregation in the United States. He's also a professor at Yeshiva University and told CBN News how Jewish scriptures helped America's founding fathers form the nation we have today. On July 4th, after the Declaration of Independence was approved, and uh, Benjamin Franklin and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson are forming a committee to decide what the seal of the United States would be, the first suggestion that Benjamin Franklin makes uh, once this committee gets going is that the seal of the United States should be Moses and Pharaoh at the sea with the motto, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. And so when Franklin is asked, what story should emphasize or embody what we are trying to do here? The first place his mind goes to is Exodus. And the inspiration goes beyond scripture. Soloveitchik says most Americans would be surprised where the idea of religious freedom originated. Jonas Phillips is uh, a man that I refer to as the most important American Jew you've never heard of. Phillips came to the colonies as an indentured servant after working off his debt in Charleston, South Carolina, he moved north, served in the Revolutionary War, and became one of the most prominent Jews in the new nation. But despite his success, religious freedom eluded him. In Pennsylvania, non-Christians could not serve in the legislature. So, in 1787, Phillips decided to push for religious liberty in a big way. Jonas Phillips writes a letter to the convention and to its president. And that president of the convention, of course, is George Washington. And so he writes to say that the Jews have fought, have been passionate patriots, and they have fought for the revolution. In his words, he says, they have fought, the Jews have fought and bled for liberty that they cannot enjoy. You have to appreciate the audacity, right? He's writing to the most revered man in America at the time, George Washington. Washington and the other leaders got the message loud and clear. The Constitutional Convention, not necessarily because of his letter, but the Constitutional Convention re concludes with a document that really for the first time bans religious tests for office. Phillips earned the respect of the founders and left quite the legacy. Benjamin Rush, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, attended Phillips' daughter's wedding. And one grandson, Uriah Phillips Levy, not only became the Navy's first Jewish Commodore, he also bought Thomas Jefferson's Monticello and preserved the estate for the American people. You see uh, an extraordinary poetry to the story of this Phillips family and the intertwining of the story of this Jewish family and the story of the founders and the story of America. The founders envisioned the creation of America as sacred and wanted a sacred covenant between God and man. And it's this covenant that Rabbi Soloveitchik believes binds Jews and Christians together as Americans. I want both Jews and Christians to come out of these lectures with uh, a renewed uh, sense of wonder at the uh, miracle that is the American story. And uh, I hope that both Jews and Christians have a renewed sense of what we share uh, as Americans uh, when we understand the role that the Bible played uh, in America's founding. Emily Jones, CBN News. Ladies and gentlemen, we must protect the future of the United States and our children by preserving the Judeo-Christian values in which our country was founded. If you have not become a PJTN watchman yet, I want to encourage you to please do so tonight. We need 7,000 watchmen who don't buy into the lies, who are willing to stand with our Jewish brethren and confront anti-Semitism in their communities. But we can't do it unless we educate our communities. We, we have to confront um, the replacement theology that has historically been the motivation behind Christian anti-Semitism 
Ignorance breeds anti-Semitism and anti-Israel bias. Your continued partnership financial and financial support will go a long way to help ensure that we stay on the front lines on this issue. It is important that we teach our children about the close bond between America and Israel and the importance of why that bond must remain strong. We must protect the future of our children and pass to them the Judeo-Christian values on which our country was founded. Your continued partnership again and financial support makes all of that possible. It's because of your prayers, your financial support, being a watchman, being involved in your community that we're able to confront this hatred. We will not keep silent, ladies and gentlemen. We are on the front lines at PJTN and in the headlines. And so I'm personally asking you to join me on the front lines of this battle. Your financial support is vital to this continued effort. We're going to watch a short video about another opportunity for you to support PJTN. Let's look at this. This month marks the 70th anniversary of the historic declaration of the State of Israel. God's sovereign hand can be seen all over this land. Included in the celebrations is the opening of the American Embassy right here in Jerusalem. In honor of this celebration, PJTN is offering a special 70th anniversary package, which includes a captivating new book and an award-winning DVD. Israel Rising is a unique visual story of Israel's miraculous journey from unforgiving desert to thriving nation. Thousands of years ago, the prophet Ezekiel foretold a future time in which the arid land of Israel would come alive for its people. Now this breathtaking book documents the fulfillment of this vision as rarely seen photographs from the 1880s to the 1940s are juxtaposed with recent photos of the same locations. This book will inspire and captivate you as it illuminates Israel's foretold awakening in a new and unforgettable way. In addition, you'll receive the award-winning documentary, Israel Indivisible, The Case for the Ancient Homeland. This inspiring film examines the many political twists and turns that make Israel the world's most controversial nation. From Abraham and the Promise to the issues facing the Jewish state today, the film examines the historical, archaeological, legal, and biblical foundations for the modern state of Israel. This is a limited time offer for these two remarkable resources for just a one-time gift of $70 today. Your generous donation will help ensure that PJTN stays on the front lines and in the headlines of all the important issues facing Israel and our Jewish brethren. So please go to PJTN.org today. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. During this segment of our program, we will discuss the rise of anti-Semitism and continue our Bible study about our biblical responsibility as Christians to stand with our Jewish brethren in Israel against this age-old hatred. In previous programs, we, dis we discussed going back to the origin of the word through a Hebraic perspective in order to put the text of Scripture in its proper context. So too should we study the foundational documents of the United States in order to put our constitutional republic into a proper perspective in order to study our history and our future from a proper historical context. We discuss the growing movement globally to revise history and we must be grounded, ladies and gentlemen, in the truth of God's word, upholding a biblical worldview, not a theological or doctrinal perspective perspective so that we will not be led astray by false prophets or false teachers. The excerpts of today's program come from Rabbi Ken Spiro, again in his book, World Perfect, The Jewish Impact on Civilization. And last week, we discussed that at the time of the, he the American Revolution, the interest in the knowledge of Hebrew was so widespread that certain members of Congress proposed that the use of English be prohibited and Hebrew substituted for us for it. This their biblical education colored the American founders' attitude toward not only religion and ethics, but most significantly politics. We see them adopting the biblical motifs of the Puritans for political reasons. For example, the struggle of the ancient Hebrews against the wicked Pharaoh came to embody the struggle of the colonists against English tyranny. 
Numerous examples can be found which clearly illustrate to what a sig significant extent the political struggles of the colonies were identified with the ancient Hebrews. The first design for the official seal of the United States recommended by Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson in 1776 depicts the Jews crossing the Red Sea. The motto around the seal read, Resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. Wow. The inscription on the Liberty Bell at Independence Hall in Philadelphia is a direct quote from Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10. Quote, Proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Patriotic speeches and publications during the period of the struggle for independence were often infused with biblical motifs and quotations. For example, Benjamin Rush, in his editorials denouncing the Tea Act, drew on inspiration from the Hebrew Bible. This is what he said. What did not Moses forsake and suffer for his countrymen? What shining examples of patriotism do we behold in Joshua, Samuel, Maccabees, and all the illustrious princes, captains, and prophets among the Jews? Likewise, Thomas Paine's anti-monarchical pamphlet, Common Sense, cited the Hebrew Bible and words of the prophet Samuel, concluding these portions of the scriptures admit no equivocal construction that the Almighty hath here entered his protest against monarchical government is true, or the scriptures are false. Even the basic framework of America clearly reflects the influence of the Bible and power of Jewish ideas in shaping the political development of America. Nowhere is this more evident than in the opening sentences of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Whereas these words echo the Enlightenment's, specifically John Locke's idea of the inalienable rights of man, without a doubt, the concept that these rights come from God is of biblical origin. This and the other documents of early America make it clear that the concept of an, of an God-given standard of morality is a central pillar of American democracy. U.S. President Woodrow Wilson in his The State acknowledges the obvious. It would be a mistake to ascribe to Roman legal conceptions an undivided sway over the development of law and institutions during the Middle Ages. The laws of Moses, as well as the laws of Rome, contributed suggestions and impulse to the men and institutions which were to prepare the modern world, and if we could have but eyes to see, we should readily discover how very much, besides religion, we owe to the Jew. Thus, we see that it is with the birth of American democracy that we have the next milestone in the process of the spread of Jewish ideas in civilization. For the first time in history, Jewish ethical ideas were legally enshrined into the laws of a non-Jewish nation. That, that country, the United States, would in turn become a powerful model to be emulated by numerous countries around the world. It's very exciting, ladies and gentlemen, to see and to read all of, of these things, things that I didn't even know until researching for these programs. But it's very inspiring to know that that's, that, were, that was the origins of our founding of this country. That is what the leaders believed. You know, it's been said that, that um, the victors write history but our victors in the United States were Jews and Christians who wrote from a biblical worldview, from a biblical perspective. We've, we've discussed um, this, this issue, this problem that we have in the United States with education. 
and how our children are being indoctrinated with propaganda. Imagine if our children were taught what we have been learning about over this series for the last four weeks. With the rise of global anti-Semitism that is being fueled by the lies in the Middle East against Israel, accusing Israel of being occupiers in their God-given land, we must sound the shofar of truth. As believers, as watchmen on the wall for Israel, we must proclaim justice and warn the inhabitants of the land. In Genesis 12:3, we are told, God told Abram, I will bless those who bless you and he who ignores you, or I will bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. But if we were to read that from the Hebraic perspective, God would have told Abram, I will bless those who bless you and he who ignores you, I will utterly destroy. Why is our mission at PJTN for such a time as this? In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse six, we are told, remember the days of yore Understand the years of each generation. We are commanded by God to study history. It has been said that history is written by the victors, as I said earlier. But again, our history was written by these godly men who wanted, who, ha who were influenced by the Hebraic roots of our faith. In the case of the United States, our history was written by Jews and Christians. That is why PJTN has committed to expose the anti-Semitic, anti-American, anti-Judeo-Christian, unconstitutional, pro-Islamic content in our nation's textbooks. Our children are being led astray, and it's time that we take back control of this situation. This is the call of our generation, ladies and gentlemen, especially if you consider yourself a Christian or a Jew. I want to close our time of study with Joel chapter 1, verse 3. We're reminded in the word God told the prophet, tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to take your questions and comments. So please send me your questions and comments right now. Hold on. From studying history, it's very clear that what starts with the Jews never ends only with the Jews. We must strongly stand against any anti-Semitic trends, for if not stopped, they'll cause harm to all of us, and we'll witness the downfall of our Judeo-Christian Western culture. Today, many people say, there's no longer a need for a Jewish state, that Jews around the world no longer need a place of refuge. But anyone who has heard recent statistics about the worldwide rise in anti-Semitism would never make such a claim. The reality is that neo-Nazi groups and Nazi sympathizers are increasing around the world. Surveys show that over one billion people in the world harbor anti-Semitic attitudes. Close to 50% believe that Jews have too much power in the business world, and two-thirds of the world's population has never heard of the Holocaust, or believe the historic accounts of it are inaccurate. If there's one thing history has taught the Jewish people, a place they can go in time of need is essential, and Israel fulfills that role. But the need for a Jewish state is not limited to being only a refuge for Jews. Jewish tradition in Israel grants full rights for women and people of all races, faiths, and gender. This tradition is what often makes Israel among the first countries to send doctors and field hospitals to any place where a natural disaster occurs, utilizing their medical advances to save lives worldwide. Muslims, Christians, and people of every faith or those of no faith have the freedom to worship or not worship as they choose. For Muslims, the Jewish state goes out of its way to provide this freedom. For example, every Israeli university gives students the option of deferring their exams during the month of Ramadan. The Knesset calls off all sessions at sunset during Ramadan to ensure that Muslim Knesset members can break their fasts with the traditional iftar dinner. In an open and democratic manner, 
Opportunities for education, advancement, and careers exist for all citizens in the Jewish state. Sadly, such rights and opportunities do not exist in any of the Muslim Arab states. For example, in neighboring Jordan, Jews cannot become citizens. And in Saudi Arabia, no non-Muslim can become a citizen. Saying that Israel must cease to exist as a Jewish state while accepting that other countries define themselves as Muslim is pure hypocrisy. In most of these countries, no rights exist for non-Muslims, women, and the LGBT community. Don't let yourself be manipulated by evil people with a wicked agenda. When the self-serving villains are in control, good people from all religions suffer. Muslims, Christians, and all people of conscience should stand proudly and show respect for a country that gives so much to the world in so many ways. Do your part, do your research, and do what you can to make a difference. Because what happens in Israel does affect us all. This is not just a Jewish or just an Israeli problem. This is a problem for all humanity, for each and every one of us who believe in freedom and human rights. Learn more about what you can do at pjtn.org. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We designed PJTN online with you in mind. I hear from Christians and Jews all over the world who tune in to watch our programs every week, who send me comments and ask me questions. So we created this program so that we could go live and we could answer your questions, um, share your comments with others. And so we're going to do just that. Um, if you do want to send a, a question or comment, you can go to comments at PJTN, send me an email at comments at PJTN.org, or you can do it right here on Facebook, just below the screen. Just We're going to look at, at the comments and questions that are coming up tonight. Um, I also just want to remind you, please visit our website at PJTN.org. Become a member, sign up to get our newsletters, action alerts, and educational um, uh, uh, articles to help inform you so that you can help us as a watchman in your community to inform your family and friends. Of course, we're right here on Facebook tonight, so like us on fa Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram as well. Visit our pjtn.org forward slash TV on YouTube and sign up to become a member. We've got a lot of programs posted there, a lot of information that you can watch throughout the week when you have time. So let's take a look at your questions and comments. And I want to just share the first one tonight comes from um, California, Rabbi Rabs who um, commented, from my studying of American Jewish history, it was the southern colonies and later states that were more committed to the Bible and who befriended the Jews. In fact, the colony of Carolina in 1669 became the first place in the world in a thousand years to ratify a constitution that explicitly protected the rights of Jews to practice Judaism. Meanwhile, the northern colonies remained anti-Semitic. Then the Confederate States of America demonstrated unparalleled adherence to the Bible and in its preamble to its Constitution mentioned God, something that the U.S. Constitution did not, as the U.S. was heavily influenced by the North, which was far less adherent to the Bible. During the war between the states, the Confederacy embraced its Jews while the North continued its anti-Semitism. I can provide all kinds of specific examples. So, Rabbi, I want to thank you for sharing that little bit of um, historic information with us. Um, let's see who else we have on comments. Um, Tammy Reynolds is with us. Hey, Lori. Yes, Tammy, we're so glad you're tuning in and Monique Crandon. So Monique has um, a question. I had, she said that I had, I had seen some information about how Israel was deporting black people. I think these people are refugees. Do you have any information about this? Monique, I, the only thing I know is about um, as much as you know. I will tell you, though, I do believe that the refugees are Sudanese 
and I don't believe that they're Jewish, and I know that there's a migrant issue going on in Israel. I'm not sure what this is about, but um, if you'll tune in next week, I will add this to the list of comments and questions that I will address. I'll get more information for you, so thank you for asking. However, I do want to mention in several of our films, um, we can't forget about the Ethiopian Jews. The Ethiopian Jews, who are also black, are citizens of the state of Israel. They're considered Jewish. And of course, um, many of them, as you all probably remember, traveled, um, walked across the desert. They saw themselves a lot like the Israelites when they fled Egypt and they had to um, walk through the desert to get to Canaan, to the, the promised land. And these Ethiopian Jews were embraced and welcomed. In fact, there was a, a campaign, I believe it was called um, Moses, where the Israeli government came in and helped to rescue um, these Jews, these blacks, these are Ethiopian, um, uh, and bring them to Israel. In fact, there are many um, Ethiopian leaders in the state of Israel. And in fact, we interviewed one in our Boycott This documentary. And if you go again to our pjtn.org forward slash, it's the uh, forward slash TV on YouTube, we did an interview with one of the Knesset members who is Ethiopian. Um, he came over as a young man with his parents and he talks about his own experience as a black man, as an Ethiopian, um, in Israel and the opportunities that the Israeli government afforded him. So, but Monique, thank you for asking that question. I will look into that for you. And let me just see if there's anyone else that we've got comments, seeing none. We are going to conclude our, our program. Um, I know some of you may be asking as you're tuning in, what can I do? How can I get involved? Again, as I stated earlier in the program, the most important thing that you can do is become educated about this issue. To sign up to become a PJTN watchman. Support us financially. Support us with your prayers. Share the information. Invite your family and friends to tune in. Most everybody has a Facebook account, but invite your family and friends and share this information um, with your with your group, your sphere of influence on Facebook, and encourage your your friends, your Facebook friends, to tune in and listen. We would love to hear from you. That's one of the ways that you can make a difference. Um, you can start by becoming informed by visiting our website. We have lots of great information and opportunities for you to get involved, especially on the textbook battle. Uh, many of you are aware that we've been fighting um, exposing the anti-Semitic, anti-American, anti-Judeo-Christian content in our children's textbooks across the country. And we're doing it because of people like you parents and citizens who decided to look into what is being taught to their children in their local schools in their community and they have they've decided to get involved in this issue so there are opportunities to get involved it just depends on what you're interested in doing and you never know there may be pjtn watchmen in your community who want to join you in your effort um, i also want to encourage you to um, partner with pjtn by signing up to become the watchman um, again, supporting our, our mission with, your, with just $20 a month, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, again, our goal for 2018 is, two, is 7,000 watchmen. Um, you can share our website with family and friends. Again, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Um, tell your family and friends. Um, I also just want to encourage you, if you want to le learn more, you can also tune into our award-winning program, Focus on Israel on Daystar TV and God TV each week. Um, Daystar's program is Saturday nights at 5.30 p.m. Central, that's 6.30 p.m. Eastern, and 3.30 p.m. Pacific Time. You can also watch our Focus on Israel show on Daystar on Sunday nights, too. So you have two chances on the weekend at midnight, Eastern Time, 11 p.m. Central, and 9 p.m. Pacific Time. Or if you're home during the day, you can also tune in to God TV on Wednesdays at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time and 11.30 p.m. Pacific Time. And you can catch our Focus on Israel shows. 
So check, our, check your local listings to find out um, our other media partners' um, uh, showtimes. You can also visit our events page on the website for upcoming programs where I will be speaking in your area if you're interested in hosting me um, and would like to arrange a speaking event. Again, you can email me at comments at pjtn.org and let me know you're interested and one of our staff would be happy to contact you and set something up. Um, and I have spoken not just in churches, but synagogues, civic groups, community groups, um, Bible study groups. Um, and also you can visit our events page and you can see where I'm going to be speaking. I may be speaking in a city near you. Um, in closing, please keep Israel in your prayers. They are continuing to be um, attacked. Uh, there were missiles last week that were continuing to rain down on Israel from the north. Um, I also want to encourage you to send us your prayer requests. We ask you to pray for us. We want to pray for you. We have a whole intercessory prayer team that is around the globe, and they are praying for our PJTN watchmen and our supporters of PJTN. So um, again, um, send us your prayer requests at comments at pjtn.org so we can pray for you. Um, I want to thank you for joining us again this evening. God bless you, and thank you for all you do on behalf of our Jewish brethren and for the state of Israel. God bless you. We'll see you next week right here on PJTN Online. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, P.O. Box 682711, Franklin, Tennessee, 37068. You can also support PJTN online. Visit PJTN.org or call 1-877-873-9020. Anti-Semitism has reached epic proportions, and Israel is now surrounded by nations who seek its destruction. For Israel to lose just one battle would mean losing everything. As Christians, it is our biblical responsibility to stand with our Jewish brethren and Israel. PJTN needs your help to reach more Christians with this urgent message. Please visit our website to become a member today and order our award-winning documentaries. You must decide that you won't be silent. Sign up now at pjtn.org. God bless you and thank you for your support and prayers.